Greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. I would like to thank you for your continued support of Back to Ashes. Please remember, if you like what you hear, down in the description below, you can buy me a coffee. It helps me and the channel out, and I would be truly appreciative. Now, it's time to go back to ashes. For when we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, and stronger person in the morning. Sit back, relax, or tuck in and get warm, and enjoy these true Let's Not Meet stories. I met my dad at a tire shop in an increased crime area of town. Not really sure why we went to this shop. It was probably around noon. My dad brought his chihuahua with him, so I took her on a walk around the tire shop while he consulted with the mechanics. The shop was about a half a football field away from a busy street, with a big filled in between the shop and the street in an otherwise residential area. I figured it was safe enough to walk the dog around in the field because my dad and the mechanics were right there. However, the shop was fenced in and not facing the field, so I guess it wasn't actually that safe for me because my dad and the employees couldn't see me. So, I was just walking the little dog around in the field not too close to the busy street. And suddenly, this beat-up car with the windows down starts driving really slowly on the busy street, and I can tell the dude driving was staring at me. The street is somewhat far away from me, and he eventually drives past, so I'm like, whatever. But then, a couple seconds later, I see the car again going down the street in the opposite direction, going really fast, and he turns onto the side street where I am. He's driving very, very fast, and he just guns it into the field where I'm walking the dog, literally jumping the curb. He's coming straight for me, very fast, and I'm frozen there, shocked, thinking, is he about to plow us down? What the F is happening? It was just so quick and unexpected. In my confused shock, I'm just hesitating with the dog, contemplating running away, but also not wanting to turn my back on the car. Then, miraculously, I guess there was some kind of uneven ground or a hole because the guy's car, which was a real beater, very old, got stuck and a wheel started spinning. With his windows down, I can hear him cursing and take this moment to scoop up the dog, about to run out of there. Then, he opens the car door, about to get out of the car. I can't remember any descriptions about this man, other than he was quite overweight. Again, because of the shock, I can't even recall his race or age range or anything. Right at that moment, a truck pulls up beside us with two youngish men inside. It was like a construction truck. They roll down the windows and ask if this guy is bothering me. They say it loudly and it spooks the guy and he goes back into his car. He then is able to peel out in reverse from whatever hole the car was stuck in. He very quickly reverses out from the field we're in, back onto the street, and takes off. The kind men who stopped apparently saw all this happen. It just happened so quickly. They were just as confused as I was. What was this dude's game plan? What was he attempting? Kidnapping me in broad daylight? obviously with people around? I'm not sure. I'm so glad his car got stuck and I didn't have to find out. It was just very strange. I'm grateful his car got stuck and the guys who drove by stopped and were willing to check out the situation. 
We chatted for a second after the guy left and were all very confused about what had happened. I can be very overconfident at times about my safety, but after a handful of other strange, potentially dangerous encounters, I've learned to always be alert. Bad things can happen anytime and anywhere, and don't freeze in fight or flight situations. So many times, I've frozen instead of fighting or flighting when I really should have taken some kind of action. Thankfully, my guardian angels had my back, but I won't take them for granted. Crazy guy in the car that tried to chase me down in the field. Let's not meet. It has taken me many years to tell the story out of both fear and embarrassment. I'm sharing this story as more than simply therapy for myself, but as a warning to all people. Be careful who you meet on social media. In 2018, my ex-husband and I, at the end of a very tumultuous marriage, He and I had been polyamorous for about three years before I met this guy. His name was Jez. I met Jez on OkCupid. I was 28 and he was 42. We hit it off very quickly. After a few weeks of talking, I agreed to meet up with him at a restaurant close to my house. We sat and talked for a few hours before I invited him over to meet my husband. Things went very well, and they seemed to get along, so Jez and I started dating. This guy completely swept me off my feet. Jez was sweet and caring. He enthusiastically listened to every little thing on my mind, engaged, and validated me. Over and over again, he absolutely revered me for my strength and wisdom. He practically worshipped me for all that I was and all I was becoming. He showered me with gifts, flowers, and random good deeds just to make me feel safe, wanted, and cared for. I had never been in a relationship that felt quite like that. It was wonderful. It was as though we had been looking for each other for years. After the first few weeks, he had a meltdown over my polyamorous nature. He pulled the plug because he said he was already falling for me and couldn't handle sharing me. I stood my ground and accepted this boundary and the fact that I would have to let him go. I left that night sad but confident that I had done the right thing for the both of us. That next week, He sent me flowers and a card to my workplace, begging for another chance and reassuring me that he would rather try than not and end up regretting it. Even though it was scary, he wanted to take this journey with me. We continued dating and it was just as wonderful. Long nights we spent awake talking, sharing, laughing, lovemaking, and planning. We went places and did things that I had always wanted to do. Then, in the deepest, most intimate moments, when we would just sit in silence, he would grip my hand to his face in solidarity and astonishment asking where I've been all this time. Our time together was effortless. We fit together like puzzle pieces. By August of 2018, my marriage had ended, by no fault of Jez's, and by October, my husband had moved out. I was on a lease at the time, and knew I couldn't afford the place on my own, so finding a roommate was essential. I had no support system to fall back on, nor did anyone else I know need a place at the time, so... Jez offered to move in. Even then, I was hesitant. We had only been together about four months, 
and I knew everything always changes when you move in with a partner. Despite my hesitation, I agreed. He was wonderful to me. How bad could it be? I was not prepared for the change that was to come. It was literally like night and day. Jez suddenly became a different person. He was extremely controlling, jealous, and lazy. Nothing like the person I thought I had met. And the way he treated me progressively got worse and worse. Hanging out with friends became a burden, if not impossible, because he would blow up my phone, guilting me about leaving him alone or not involving him in some way. Yet when I tried to, it was also treated as a burden and an inconvenience, as he would huff and puff his way through even the concept of leaving space for anyone but ourselves. In December 2018, we attended my work Christmas party. I had given him the option whether he wanted to go or not. It was really neither here nor there for me, especially because I had already learned that he really didn't do well if he felt pressured into social situations. I opened the invitation to him because he had expressed to me over and over that it was important for him that he was involved in my social life. For the full month, he knew about it. He insisted that he wasn't going. I took it as him being introverted and didn't push the issue. I let him know that I would make sure he felt welcome if he decided to go, but not to feel obligated. I was surprised when he changed his mind at the last minute and insisted on going. And even more stunned when we went and he actively acted as though he did not want to be there. Everyone there was incredibly welcoming and included him in the festivities and conversation. However, he still practically grumbled the entire night about the entire thing mumbling insults and critiquing every little part of the party under his breath, as though being there was an absolute, awful experience he had to endure. No one really seemed to notice the low whispering insults and gripes. At one point, after a couple of glasses of wine, my direct manager leaned in to Jez and started praising him. She and I were very close, Therefore, she was intimately familiar with what I had gone through with my ex-husband. I am so, so happy she has you. She bleated through wine happy. You have been absolutely transformative for her. It's so nice to see her finally happy and appreciated. Without missing a beat, Jez grimaced at the comment and quickly snapped back. You don't effing know me. I honestly didn't believe my ears. It was one of those moments where time stops and you just know you couldn't have heard that correctly. I sat brewing on it for a minute before another lighthearted interaction with Jez prompted him to suddenly snap at me through grit teeth. Stop it. This triggered me, and I lost it. I pulled him outside and asked him what his problem was. I called out his behavior and told him if he was going to act that way, then he could just leave. That if he didn't want to be there, he could have stayed home. He ended up giving a sort of half-assed apology, and we went back inside and finished the party. I remember the drive home that night staring out the dark window at nothing in particular, in worried silence. I might have messed up, was my only thought through the entire drive. This all started out slow, of course, like waving me away or invalidating my experiences and ideas due to my age, that I was just dramatizing my experiences because I was young, etc. The man who not six months prior, had validated me, my trauma, 
and experiences to the ends of the earth. Now, every time I started a story or tried to share anything, even trying to plan out meals for the week, he would openly show annoyance as though I was violating his time and attention. Before I knew it, he was snapping at me over every little thing. If I asked how his day was or talked about my day, I would aggressively shut it down. Why do you always ask me that? I don't want to talk, shop at home. I really don't care about your work, it's work. Before I knew it, I couldn't even bring him a plate of breakfast without being snapped at. It was as though he was testing me. When Jez and I first started dating, he flat out refused to talk about most all of his exes. He refused to name them or discuss any of the issues or lessons learned. They didn't matter, he would claim. They weren't in his life for a reason. It was the same reasoning he also used in reference to my more recent exes, talking about them, including my now ex-husband, may as well have become off-limits. Anytime I brought up either of our exes, he would become incredibly agitated, belittling, and just overall very aggressive. I took this as both an age gap issue, as I have a tendency to dwell, as well as insecurity and a threat to the life he was trying to build. However, after he moved in and this hot-button topic had been established, several times he would bring up his exes and how they looked, telling me on more than one occasion he would have never dated me back in the day, and that I was lucky he lowered his standards. I didn't even really know what to say to this. I would laugh it off and shove it in my back pocket. Noted. He then started bringing up my looks and accusing me of catfishing him. I had stopped taking care of myself due to the isolation and had also put on some weight. So most of my clothes that I had once felt great in no longer fit. And since Jez had also been dishonest with me about his financial position. He was always needing extra money here and there, leaving me broke almost all the time. A horrible tragedy happened that following summer while Jez and I were together. I received notice that a good friend I went to art school with shot himself in the head while tripping on LSD. Our whole class was devastated he was, without contest, the best photographer of our class and one of the most kind-hearted individuals I have ever had the pleasure of knowing. Also, as someone who was very familiar with LSD, I was rocked. Jez, however, was far from supportive. He pretty much immediately shrugged it off. That's life. I guess that's what he gets for messing around with LSD. I was baffled at such an unsympathetic response, and even more later, when Jez started to interrogate me about my relationship with this guy, asking when the last time it was that I had even talked to this friend. You don't even know this guy anymore. Who cares? I broke up with him the first time after he called me at work raging. I was busy, so I wasn't able to answer right away. But once I was finally able to answer, I was met with intense anger. It was storming and one of my dogs was having an anxiety attack due to the storm and separation anxiety. This wasn't the first time, and he was well aware of what she needed in those moments. Why the F are you answering my calls? You answer when I call you. I don't care where you are. He went on for a few minutes, calling me a shitty girlfriend and laying into me over my sudden distance and lack of communication while I was at work. At this point, I was done and I lost it. I tore into him over everything, 
especially causing problems for me at work. That being in my life is a privilege, and if he's going to wake up every day acting like he hates me, then I don't know what on earth he's even doing with me. I told him that I expected him to get his things and leave. He was always threatening to go back to his old roommates where there was still a room. I didn't want him there when I got home, and we could coordinate times for him to come and get the rest. He flat refused, suddenly victimizing himself, claiming he had nowhere to go. How dare you make me fall in love with you? How dare you take me to meet your father and then dump me? My manager and her husband ended up following me home that evening because she was concerned for my safety and had offered to let me stay with her for a few days. I will never forget the scene I walked into. Like Theon Greyjoy begging for his life, my boss stood next to me, watching as this 42-year-old man crawled on his knees before me, begging for mercy and communication. At one point, wrapping his arms around my legs, crying into them. I can't believe this is happening. She's the love of my life. You know that. He cried to my boss. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. This was the antithesis of the heartless person I had been spending my days with. I shook him off then went to the back of the house, gathering enough of my things to get me through the next few days, as well as any and all valuables I could think of. It took a few days, but after about a week, Jez started blowing up my phone, apology after apology. Suddenly, he was the man I met again, full of humility and self-awareness. He acknowledged the awful way he had treated me and sent me walls and walls of well-thought-out messages psychoanalyzing his own behavior, where it comes from, and the ways he knows it needs to change. I took him back, like a dumb, desperate girl. I took him back. It wasn't long into the second round that he started to guilt me over the breakup. My panic had damaged his relationship with the people in my life, and he made sure that I knew it was my responsibility to fix it. It wasn't long after this that my car ended up breaking down at a gas station close to home. There was a very nice couple in the vehicle next to me that came to my rescue and checked things out under my hood. The gentleman turned out to be a mechanic for a living, so he had a pretty good theory about what could potentially be going on. By this time, I had already attempted to contact Jez to let him know what was going on and where I was. It wasn't long till he got off work, so he told me to sit tight and he would be there shortly. Meanwhile, the sweet couple stayed put and kept me company while I waited. Jez barreled in about 15 minutes later, completely ignoring the couple that had helped me. Touching base, the gentleman handed me a slip of paper with a name and phone number on it, reviewing what he thought was going on with my car before Jez butted in, cutting him off. I said, she's fine, he snapped. I could see the woman out of the corner of my eye slink away at this comment and get into the passenger seat of their car. I could feel the sudden tension, like maybe she's been here before. The gentleman didn't move and shifted his attention to me as Jez walked into the store. I could see he was clearly concerned. Are you okay? He asked in a low, almost whisper. You don't have to answer that, but if you need anything. He looked down at the number in my hand and nodded to it. Seriously. With that, he got into the driver's seat of the car and drove away. I've thought about that couple countless times since that night. Everything went right back to the way it was before, as though the initial breakup never even happened. The same eggshells, the same belittling. If anything, it was worse, 
because I had permanently damaged our relationship. If I had just not been so dramatic, if I didn't run away from everything, then maybe he wouldn't have to work so hard for respect in my life. One night, we got into an argument. I didn't even remember what it was about, but I had to be up early for work the next morning, so I paused the argument in order to get some sleep. When I went to lay down, I heard the TV turn on. I have a sound bar, so the volume could get pretty loud. Jazz proceeded to turn the volume up and up and up, far past any volume I ever pushed those same speakers to even for parties. The very walls were reverberating with the sound of the TV at astronomical volumes. Jez then started laughing hysterically. It was a laughter manic with anger, as though something might be funny on TV, but he might also jump through a window right now. I remember laying in bed, absolutely horrified at what was happening. I knew things had gotten bad, but now I was scared. I got out of bed and asked him to turn it down, to which he responded, scoffing. I'll watch TV if I effing want to, and turned it up even louder. I felt like I was in a horror movie. I started crying at this point, begging him to please, please just let me sleep. He started mocking me and calling me names for crying. Oh, wah, poor baby is crying again. That's your card, isn't it? Crying? This caused the fight to start again, and he started screaming at me, followed me to my bedroom, where he suddenly punched a door not two inches from my head. His eyes were black, and he looked me in the eye, sending the clear, unsympathetic, and hostile message that that was a warning, and next time he wouldn't miss. My whole system had shut down at this point, and I sunk to the floor in a panic attack. My ex-husband had issues with violence. Jez knew that. All our rentals prior to that one had holes in walls, and doors peppered throughout our unit due to my ex-husband's inability to handle his emotions. But he never hit me, or even came close to it. I crumpled to the ground feeling powerless, trapped, and afraid. As my thoughts continued to race, he continued to berate and mock my panic state. Most of our argument from that night was a blur, but ended abruptly once he threatened to put my social security number on the dark web. At this point, all that was left in me was to fight. I blacked out and went ballistic, screaming at him to get out. I felt rabid and dangerous as I screamed like a banshee for him to leave my home. It was over, and I was ending it that second. I contacted my landlord and explained what had been going on. Jez would also end up contacting her, weaving his own tell that I was moving out and tried to have the lease transferred into his name. Luckily, since I was several steps ahead of him, my landlord didn't fall for it and contacted me immediately. She personally came and changed my locks for me, gave me the personal contact of a police officer close by in case he showed up again, and took half off my rent for the next month. I am forever grateful to her for these simple acts of kindness that were above and beyond anything I would ever expect from a landlord. It took weeks for him to stop messaging me. The only reason I didn't block him was out of fear that he would show up at my house. Though I had contacts for protection, I knew I would rather get a daily apology video than have to deal with him on my doorstep. So they persisted. For a while, the same act from before, the love bombing, the promises, grasping at straws trying to find the weak spot where I would let him back in but I ignored it. It continued for weeks before he finally gave up. He bowed out gracefully, stating boldly that he will always love me. I left him on red, 
the illusion was destroyed. It took me several years to pick up the pieces. If my divorce wasn't enough, this definitely made me lose trust in myself. I still don't understand what the end game was. In one of our last discussions, I asked him desperately, what happened to the guy I fell in love with? Jez looked me dead in the eye, smirked and said, that guy doesn't exist. I told you what I had to tell you in order to get you away from that effing asshole husband of yours. You're just stupid and fell for it. Jez, I hope we never ever meet again. I currently live in an RV in my mom's driveway. My town is on the larger side and it's relatively safe. Lots of rich people, doctors, live here so it's kept very nice and crime is relatively low. I never expected something to happen to me. But tonight, I met a man and he was a reminder to me to always lock my door. Sometimes I forgot to lock my door, even while sleeping, and it's never been a big deal to me because my town is generally safe. But I'll be locking my door from now on. It was 2 a.m. and I took my garbage outside to the bin. When I turned around, I noticed a figure in the dark walking towards me. I started to quickly walk away, but he spoke to me. He was a short man, probably in his 50s or 60s. I'm 23 and female. He started talking to me about my living in the RV, and I took charge of the conversation to shut it down quickly. He told me what house he lives in and his name. He was being polite, but very creepy. I'm sure nearly every woman gets what I mean. That older man, kind of creepy and too polite to you because you're a very young, pretty woman. He told me I should come by his house sometime, and I'm like, uh, yeah, sure, maybe one day. Have a good night. And I walked back to my RV and locked the door. I figured he had left, but he didn't. I don't have a curtain on my window right now, and I could hear him pacing outside my window and mumbling to himself. I was just hiding, but I wanted to lock the door by my bed. It doesn't open at all anyway but I decided to lock it regardless. I got up and looked outside, and he was staring right at me. He was waving his hand at me to get my attention, walking right up to my window and acting so erratic. It was so different from the guy I just met. I locked my door, and he watched me, and after that, he left my window. I felt like he was still there, Five or so minutes pass, and then he's knocking on my RV door. I don't know if he tried to get in or not. It's just a flip handle, so I can't hear it or anything. I just waited there for an hour before I grabbed a knife and ran into my mom's house. I'm definitely getting a taser and a gun. I think he'd been standing across the street watching me. There's no reason for him to have just been outside my RV at 2 a.m. I think he's been watching me, too. People shouldn't really know that I live in the RV. Walking down the street, that's not something I take notice of. I've only even started to pay attention to RVs and driveways since I started living in one. And still, I don't notice if people actually are living in them or not. Maybe I'm being naive, but it makes me wonder if he's been watching me, seeing that I live in the RV day after day. I don't go outside of my RV. I'm a homebody. So he'd have to have been staring into my RV to really even notice someone actually living in it. It terrifies me. I was so afraid of his intentions. 
he makes me realize that even though I'm in a safe town, I'm still a young pretty woman. I'm a target on men's lists. It sucks that this is our world. It sucks that there's men out there who are like this towards women. To that creepy old man, let's not ever meet again. This story I'm about to tell you is a real story and has absolutely traumatized me and my boyfriend. Two years ago, I moved to the UK for university, as I always wanted to go there and get away from my parents, as the situation at home was beginning to become too toxic for me. In first year at uni, I moved into a student accommodation and met some really great people It was a good year, without meeting my boyfriend, who I'm still with, and just enjoying my time away from my family, and discovering what independence really meant. Anyway, as second year came by, I decided with some friends to move into a house rented by student accommodations, but at least we had our own house and weren't restricted as much with noise and parties as living in a small shared flat like in first year. Quick note, I had a ground floor room. My window gave into a very small backyard in which I would go smoke every day as I am a smoker and in which there would be a very thin wooden door giving in to the other side of the street where you would put your bins and broken chairs, yada yada. The door could only be closed and locked from inside the backyard but since it was an old door, we had to attach some strings to keep it closed for good. I had neighbors on each side of the house, so we were surrounded by families and some other student accommodations. The neighbors on the right of us were five boys who looked way over the age of being in university. They were strange, so to say. I met one of them outside of our house one day because of a police intervention due to one of his flatmates attacking him and the others with a kitchen knife and burning their kitchen down. I heard some screams and so I went outside with my flatmates and saw one of them being covered in blood and cuts everywhere on his arm and a wound on his head inflicted by a kitchen knife. Me and my flatmates didn't know what to do so we offered him our help to clean himself and gave him an old t-shirt to change out of his bloody clothes. We then saw the guy who hurt these flatmates being escorted out by the police and into a van and driven off to be arrested. I don't know anything more about the story. The police didn't really tell us anything. Anyway, the guy who we helped was quite weird. He said a lot of BS and kept trying to grab me and flirting with me. And we noticed when helping him, he smoked quite a lot of marijuana and just didn't really care at the moment, as we just wanted to make sure he was okay as we didn't know him. Then, after some time had passed, I would go to uni and come back home and see him quite often in the street and just never said a word to him again. But, one day, he came up to me in the street while I went to the corner shop and started talking to me weirdly, and I didn't feel comfortable at all with that for some reason, so I just didn't respond to him. He then just said, Oh, that's okay. I'll just wait in front of your house then, and we can talk further. No need to say, I was creeped out, and just thought he was joking. So, I bought my drink at the shop and headed back to my street, and as I turned into the street where my house was, I saw him with his flatmate sitting on my doorstep and waiting for me. I panicked and went back next to the corner shop and called my only guy flatmate to ask him to open the door and tell the guys to go away. But obviously, he wasn't home, and no one else was either. So I literally just waited it out until they left one hour later and then sprinted back home and locked the front door. Quick note. 
My front door had a glass panel on it where you would be able to kind of make out who was standing in front of it. After this already pretty scary encounter, I just tried to avoid the guy and mostly succeeded for a while. But then one day, as I went smoking in the backyard, I noticed that the wooden door, which is always closed, was open and the strings that we put there to keep it closed were cut off. For whatever reason, I didn't think anything of it and just closed the door again and put a new string on it, thinking it was one of my flatmates who took the bins out and just didn't tie it back. The weird neighbors would very often scream and yell and fight in their house, and it would wake me and my flatmates up in the middle of the night, but we kind of got used to it after a while. One evening, my boyfriend slept over like he usually did, and he, who usually never ever wakes up because of a noise, woke up in the middle of the night because of a bang and some whispering. I was sound asleep, so he very silently woke me up, and we both just waited in the dark and listened for any other noises. Suddenly, we heard the wooden door just bang just shot open and some footsteps next to my window. I always had my window open because it would get really warm inside. So we both froze, and then we heard the door leading to the backyard get shaken softly as if they were trying to get inside, and then they stopped. Luckily, we had the curtains closed so they couldn't see us, but we were ready to get dressed and get the F out of the room and lock them in if they came in from the window. Then, we just heard my window move and get more open and one of the guys saying something in a different language that we didn't understand and started to hear them trying to get in. My boyfriend and I shot up out of bed, took my phone and put clothes on and ran out of the room and out of the house. I then called my flatmates and told them to lock themselves in their rooms and then called the police, who luckily came in less than five minutes as the headquarters were a couple of streets down from us. I don't remember anything after the police came. I think me and my boyfriend were in shock. They ended up catching one guy. The other fled and was later found a few streets up smoking weed. The police told us that they went inside of their house and found a lot of meth and heroin, and that they were also carrying a massive kitchen knife with them. I was so confused, as I've never done anything to offend or do anything wrong to my neighbors. So the idea of them breaking in with God knows what intentions with a kitchen knife terrorized me and my boyfriend. The two guys ended up being arrested and one of them was put in prison for two years for carrying a weapon with intention to harm. I never heard anything else from the police, and I moved back home a few months later, as I was so scared and it tormented me for months on end, not knowing what would have happened if my boyfriend didn't wake up. I'm now still coping with it and finding it really tough to get over of always asking myself what if and what would have happened if. I now very often wake up because of the slightest noise and get horrible nightmares because of it. But hey, at least I'm still with my boyfriend and we often talk about it and it helps a lot. To the crazy guys that live next door to me, let's not ever meet again. This happened a few years ago, right before the pandemic hit. In fact, I know the exact date because it spooked me to my core. It was February 18th, 2020. I was 14 years old, so you can imagine this was a pretty frightening moment for a young girl. My mother, younger brother, and I went to go see a movie. He wanted to see the new Sonic film and I didn't really want to, so I went to see the Birds of Prey movie with Harley Quinn. I had already seen the movie, but I wanted to enjoy the cinema popcorn and hot dog, and quite frankly, wanted to watch it again. 
I had gone off by myself to the viewing room, and it was completely empty. Just me in there, so I felt relatively safe, being able to see the whole room, given I was at the very top. It was pretty amazing to have an entire room to yourself. Until it's not. About halfway through the film, I went to the restroom. The soda didn't last long. So I went to the restroom and once again, it was just me in there. Every room was in current running progress, so nobody wanted to miss the films. As I was finishing up, there was an elderly lady at the sink. She was probably in her 70s. I thought I was alone, but I suppose not. She was washing her hands right next to me. She had moved from her original spot. Now, for context, before I say what she said to me, I'll give you a brief description of myself. I have black hair, green eyes, relatively sharp features, high cheekbones, and arched brows. Yeah, a typical Disney villain, which I somewhat blame for her response. I think I'm somewhat attractive, but nothing to lose your marbles over. She had looked at me with the most subtle but unnerving grin, still with her hands under the water, but not doing anything and said, Young lady, you are quite a gorgeous girl. I said thank you, and she went on to say, A beauty like that is only something an evil thing can have. Your eyes are just so hollow and soulless. She continued with that same damn smile. I was seriously starting to get creeped out, but I do live in the Bible Belt of Texas, so I chalked it up to her being a nut job. But then she got closer and said, without the smile, you shouldn't have that beauty. I hurried and left as soon as I possibly could. I didn't like being alone with that woman anymore and I waited outside the restroom where it was populated but she never came out. After five minutes, I went back to the viewing room and was paranoid the entire rest of the film. I could not get that crazy lady out of my head. Who says something like that to a kid? I seriously considered getting exercised by a priest after that encounter. After that, I told my mother and she didn't let me go alone until I was at least 16. I still get paranoid after that anytime I'm alone in a public restroom. In fact, I avoid them altogether. Still don't know what to make of it. To that crazy lunatic lady, I hope we never meet again. There's an abandoned house between my town and the town next to me on one of the country roads that connects us. I've been to it before and even went inside twice with my sister and my best friend. It's an old house that dates back centuries, according to the bank records that I was able to find, and you can just tell by the design. The house is two stories with a basement, has lots of furniture and objects strewn about inside, and is far from empty. You can tell that it hasn't been lived in for decades, and whoever had previously owned it, it almost seemed like they just disappeared one day, leaving everything behind. The way I was able to get in before was through the cellar door in the basement, which is broken open and propped up with some big sticks. My first visits were around two years ago, and I hadn't gone back at all in that time. Another friend had expressed interest in seeing the house when I told him about my experience. And so, last summer, I told him that I'd take him to it. I never thought it was a dangerous trip and told him that it's just an interesting place to explore. We parked across the street from the house in the parking lot of one of the industrial buildings nearby. My friend, being braver than me despite my previous visits, led the way across the street into the front of the house. He asked me a couple of questions about it and what stuff I had found in there. 
I told him that the kitchen still had expired food in it, and that the upstairs had a board game set that I ended up bringing home with me. As we walked from the front of the house to the side leading to the back with the cellar, I made note that there was a lot more brush than when I went in last time. I had gone in the spring when I had gone with my sister and best friend, and I never experienced the thick brush that I was now carefully moving through. I made a comment to my friend that there was a lot more foliage than when I had gone before, as we tried to figure out a path to the cellar. Eventually, we pushed through some branches and found the cellar, broken and propped open, just as I had last seen it. We talked for a second about being nervous, and I really took in the view of the cellar that led into this dark, abandoned house. I remember being really intimidated while looking at the opening, and I made note that some of the sticks propping open the cellar didn't look familiar to me. I didn't state it out loud, however, as I thought it was just my anxiety. My friend and I discussed who should go first, and he said since I'm the expert, I should head in first. I was hesitant, but eventually, after a good five minutes of breathing and calming myself down, I started down the few steps of the cellar. It was an awkward entrance, as half the cellar was collapsed and left little room for maneuvering. You had to duck under a part of the cellar door that was still put together, then enter feet down the steps and finally turn your body sideways to fit through the small gap into the basement. I took a long time after ducking under the door, since my nerves came back for a second. I made it in just fine, and my friend followed very quickly, which I appreciated. We both stood in the corner of the basement now, taking it in. I turned my phone's flashlight on, and he did too. There was a spider web in the path to the stairs up to the first floor. I looked around and found some sort of tool to knock the spider web down, and I took the tool and swiped it through the web. After that, I tossed the tool onto the concrete floor. My friend and I talked quietly. I don't remember what about, but afterwards, we fell silent for a second. Above us, I clearly heard footsteps on the boards above our heads. It almost seemed like they were heading to the stairs that led to the basement. I remember this part the best as I looked at my friend and he didn't seem to react to the footsteps I was hearing. I looked at him, suddenly very worried, and before I could even say anything, he said, We need to go. He turned around and practically jumped up the stairs. I remembered thinking he got out insanely fast. I could see him turn and reach his hand back to help me up. I was a bit slower, but I also quickly stepped up the stairs and he pulled me through the opening. I landed on my hands and knees after I escaped the cellar and I immediately stood up facing the weeds. I turned around to my friend who was crouched staring down the cellar. I said to him that we should get out of here and he turned away and told me to go first through the weeds. I pretty much just ran through the brush, definitely getting cut up by something, but we made it through then and back in front of the house very quickly. My friend kept urging me to go in front of him and he watched behind us before switching to flashing his light in the windows on the first floor of the front of the house. I asked him what he was doing, and if he was okay. He didn't really answer me at first, so I asked him if he heard the footsteps before we bolted out of the basement. He turned to me and said that he had heard them, and that's why he was watching the cellar, to see if anyone was following us out. He continued saying that after he pulled me up, he turned to guide me away before he let go of my hand, and when he turned back, he saw the bare feet of someone standing at the bottom of the cellar. Because of the cellar's dilapidated structure, 
he could only see their feet and a part of their legs. At that point, that's when he told me to go through the weeds first. He never saw them come up the cellar stairs or move away from them before he followed me. I didn't believe him at first and thought he was just trying to scare me, but I could tell by the serious tone of his voice and the silent look he gave me after telling me that he wasn't trying to make me laugh or lighten the mood. I still asked if he was lying, and he aggressively said that he wasn't. He told me that I heard the footsteps already, so I knew something had to be in that house. We stood for a second, not really saying anything, before we both then agreed to go back across the street towards our cars. We stood by our cars for a while, watching the house to see if anything or anyone would come out, but nothing appeared. After talking for a bit about how crazy that was and him reassuring me that he was telling the truth, it started to rain and we decided to call it a night. I fully believe him and he's always stood by what he saw. I haven't gone back to that house since and I like to tell myself that Whoever was in that house was just a homeless person finding shelter. I still get shivers to this day, however, thinking about how close that person was to me as I scrambled up the cellar. To that mysterious person trying to follow me out of the cellar. Let's never meet. I was around 9 or 10 years old when this happened, but I remember clearly pretty much everything that had happened. So this was at school. It was lunch break, which lasted two hours. I was with a group of friends and we were playing like pretty much everyone else, but we started to notice people in front of the school. And when I mean people, I mean around 20. Usually there wasn't anyone or they were just walking by. They all had their phone in their hands. A woman approached the entry of the school and she just started taking pictures of every kid she saw. An adult of the school went to see her and told her to stop but she didn't. Instead, she just smiled terrifyingly at him and said something I didn't hear but it looked kind of like when a mother confronts you in a it's going to be okay sort of way. He started to get mad because, well, taking photos of children like that is just weird as hell. Eventually, she went away, but that didn't really change anything if you want my opinion, because everyone else in front of the school was taking pictures of us. Everyone, literally. I especially remember a guy that was pretending to call, except that he didn't talk, and he also had his flash on so he quickly understood he was also taking pictures. Us kids thought it was fun and a sort of game, so we started playing hide and seek with them. Being like, ooh, he flashed me, I'm gonna die. Or stupidities like that. But we really started to understand there was a real problem when one of them tried to open the entry. That was kind of useless since the barriers weren't high enough. So if he wanted to get in, he could just climb right over it. And that's when the headmaster got totally mad and went to see everyone, yelled at them for around 10 minutes, called the police, and when she calmed down, she asked to explain someone why and what they were doing. The headmaster told us herself that all these people pretended to be some sort of voodooists and that they could sell pictures of us and make us suffer, etc. To be honest, Everyone mostly laughed, but the adults didn't seem amused at all. To this day, I don't know if what she said was true. I don't know if some people were arrested. I don't know what the pictures became of. The thing I remember the most is just that woman's smile. That absolutely creeped me out. Today, I'm scared of my photo being taken, even with my friends. And when it's family members or very close friends, I'm just really uncomfortable. 
to the creepy people outside our school taking our pictures. I hope we never meet again. Now, this is something I really want to talk about to be sure that everyone is cautious and stays level-headed at all times. For context, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Canada. It was an old town that had quite a few abandoned buildings due to absence of residents. Me and many friends were tired of the lack of entertainment options for us. So, what we did was explore these abandoned buildings. Prior to the experience I'm about to talk about, we never had anything too crazy happen to us. Occasionally, we'd see a small bit of blood-like liquid, and we did see a pentagram on the ground from someone who went to a house previously, but nothing too bad. Until the last time I had gone exploring abandoned buildings. Now, when I was younger, I used to go to a daycare that was part mental hospital. Weird combination, I know. It closed down due to a lack of patients and lack of children at the daycare. I decided to go back there with my friends a few years ago. For context, I was 15 when this happened. Most of my friends were the same age. When we did get there, it was rather cliche. There was fog, it was rather dark, and there was a light drizzle of rain. We went to the main gate, which was padlocked shut. We decided to help each other hop over it and made a ton of noise. We were laughing and giggling the whole time, unsuspecting of what was to come. We looked around the small play place and the park with flashlights we had on our person. Even with our somewhat powerful flashlights, our visibility was rather limited. We decided to enter the decaying building. Glass and dirt crunched under our feet as we stepped into the daycare section of the complex. There were still old Legos, wood chips from previous furniture, old torn dolls and toys strewn about. The further we walked around the daycare section, we naturally became more and more silent until all we could hear was the crunch of the dirt under our feet. I found some crayons in a plastic container in the corner of the room. I walked over to pick them up when all of a sudden we heard a loud crash coming from behind a metal door leading to the psych ward part of the building. My friends and I looked at each other. As a whole, we were a group of five. Most of them were very bold and cocky. We all looked at each other when my friend Brian suggested we go and look to see where the sound came from. Personally, I was not too fond of this idea, but with my group of friends, there was no way anyone was going to decline such a thing. We all stacked up on the door and opened it. It was rusted to the floor, and we heaved to get it open. As we walked in, the metallic smells and must became stronger, with a hint of something else which I couldn't put my finger on at that moment. We walked in, our flashlights pointed in every direction, with Brian leading the group. The hallways were tight, and to the left and right were the occasional metal doorway, some with doors open. I felt slightly claustrophobic, and it felt a little hard to breathe. As we continued, Brian shone his flashlight into a room and recoiled. We all stopped walking as Brian slowly entered the room. What is it? I asked him. I thought I saw someone here. Uh, it seems all fine now. To be honest, I thought he was just messing with us to increase our anxiety. But looking back, I think he was telling us the truth. He backed out of the room, and we continued walking deeper into the psych ward, when another friend swiftly told us to stop. We came to a halt and all listened. In the distance ahead of us, 
we heard the subtle pitter-patter of footsteps echo through the hallway. We all looked at each other, fear in each of our eyes. Brian continued walking towards the sounds. We considered turning back for a second without Brian, wondering if some ghost or something was in the building. But we couldn't do that to him. The closer we got, the more I felt like I was being watched. When finally, we entered a room on the right, which had the smell of rotting meat. In front of us was a dead deer. Its innards were spilled all over the floor, staining the concrete. A friend of mine had a very weak stomach and vomited everywhere. That's when we heard whispering from somewhere. Brian showed his flashlight to the corner of the room, where a man with short hair was standing with his head down. He wore a bright green t-shirt stained with what I assumed was blood and torn beige pants. He didn't have on any socks and his feet looked damaged. He was twitching sporadically and continued to mumble even after we saw him. We stared at him for a solid 30 seconds before he made his first true movement. He looked up at us with a haunting grin that sent shivers down our spine. You guys here for the feast? He said, each word with varying inflection and energy. This kicked us over the edge and we bolted out of that room all the way back to the daycare center. The door was still open and we decided to try and slam it shut, but the rust and pure weight of the door almost kept it open. It took three of us pulling with all of our strength to close it. And just before we did, I could still see the silhouette of the man watching us, his white teeth being the only other human feature I could see. As we sat behind the metal door catching our breath for a second, all looking at each other for confirmation that we all saw the same thing. After a little bit of labored breathing from each of us, we heard a light tapping on the door. That's when we decided that it was time to leave. We booked it out of the vicinity completely and ran all the way home. A year after we visited that spot, police went back to do a routine search of the area and found the man. It was stated that this guy used to go to the psych ward before it closed down. He escaped the facility he was transferred to and lived off the wildlife around the complex. When the cops brought him in, he had a series of diseases and sickness from eating raw meat. His mental condition was much worse than before. There were future rumors that he did kill someone in the forest while searching for food, but nothing has been confirmed. In the end, everyone, please be careful especially in dangerous areas such as abandoned buildings. Oh, and to the creepy dude, let's never meet again. And that, dear listeners, is the end of these true Let's Not Meet stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you kindly. If you are awake and listening to these, I hope you have enjoyed this collection. Until next time, I'll read to you soon. Have a good morning, a good afternoon, or good night.